The Restaurant and the Universe, Chapter 24. Ah, uh, Captain, yes, Number 1. Just had a sort of report thingy back from Number 2. Oh, dear. High up on the bridge of the ship, the captain stared out into the infinite reaches of space in mild irritation. And where he climbed beneath a wide, doomed bubble, he could see before, above him, a vast panorama of stars through which they were moving, a panorama that fiend out noticeably during the course of the voyage, turning and looking backward over the vast two-mile bulk of the ship. He could see the far denser mass of stars behind them, which seemed to form almost a solid band. This was a view through the galactic centre from which they were travelling, and indeed they had been travelling for years at speed. He couldn't quite remember at the moment, he knew it was terribly fast. Something approaching the speed of something or other, or was it three times the speed or something else? Jolly impressive anyway. He peered up into the light, bright distance, but behind the ship looking for something. He did this every few minutes or so, but never found what he was looking for. He didn't let it worry him, though. Don't his chaps had been very insistent that everything was going to be perfectly all right, Providing nobody panicked and everybody got on and did their bit in an orderly fashion. He wasn't panicking. As far as he was concerned, everything was going splendidly. He dabbed at his shoulder with a large, frothy frum, sponge. It crept back onto his mind that he was feeling mildly irritated about something. Now, what was that? What was all, was all that about? A slight cough alerted him to the sight. The ship first officer was still standing nearby. Nice chap, number one. Not the one, that, not of the very jolliest, but the odd sort of difficulty. He trying his suit laces, but jolly good officer material for all that. And the captain wasn't a man to kick a chap when he was bending over trying to do, do up his shoelaces. How long? How long? How long however long it took him. Not like that ghastly number two strutting about while the place polishing his. Buttons and issuing reports every hour. Ships are still moving, Captain. Still on course, Captain. Option never still being maintained, Captain. Give it a miss, was the Captain's vote. Oh, yes. There was one thing that had been irritating him. He peered down at number one. Yes, Captain. He was shouting something or other about having found some prisoners. Captain thought about this. Seemed pretty unlikely to him that he wasn't one to stand his officer's way. Well, perhaps they'll keep they'll keep him happy for a bit. He said he's always wanted some. Full prophet and half a dent trudged toward onward. The ship up the ships apparently endless corridors. Number two marched behind him, barking the occasional order but not making any false moves or trying any funny bit stuff. They seemed to be have passed at least a mile continuous brown hesian wall weave. Finally they reached a large steel door which slid open when number two, number two shouted at it that he entered. To the eyes of full prefect and Arthur Dent, the most remarkable thing about the ship's bridge was not the 50-foot diameter he- hemispiritual dome which covered it, yeah, and though which was dazzling display of stars shone down on them into people who were eating all at the, re- at the restaurant and in the well, universe, which wonders were commonplace or commonplace. Nor was a bewildering array of instruments that crowded the long circumferential wall around them. To Arthur, this is exactly what the spaceships were traditionally supposed to look like. And Ford looked fairly anchor- uh, to Ford it looked fairly anchored. He confirmed his suspicion that disaster their stunt ship had taken them back at least a million, if not two million years before their own time. No, the thing that really caught them off guard was the bathtub. Bathtub stood on a six foot pedestal a roughly hued blue water crystal and was a bare creek monstrosity, monstrosity not seen outside the Megalian Museum of Diseased Imaginings. A intestinal jumble of plumbing being picked out of gold leaf rather than dis- discreetly buried at midnight. Then discreetly buried at midnight in an unmarked grave. 
The taps and shower attachment would have made a goil goil jump. As the, at the dormant centerpiece of the spaceship bridge, it was terribly wrong, and it was the embittered air of a man who knew that number two approached it. Captain Sir, he shouted through clenched teeth, a difficult trick, but he had years doing which to perfect it. He had years doing which to perfect it. A large genial face, genial form, covered, arm popped up above the rim of the monstrous bath. Oh, hello, number two, said the captain, waving a cheery sponge. Having a nice day, number two snapped even further to attention where he already was. I brought you the prisoners are located in the freezer bay. Seven, sir, he yapped, folding off a coughed in confusion. Ah, uh, hello, they said. The captain beamed at them. So number two had really found some prisoners. Well, good for him, thought the captain. Nice to see a chap doing what he what he did his best at. Oh, hello there, he said to them. Excuse me not for not, not getting up. Just having a quick bath. Well, Jimmy and the Nork took her gets all around them. Look in the fridge, number one. Certainly, sir. It's a curious fact, one which no one knows quite how much importance to attach, that something like 85% of all known wells in the galaxy, be the primitive or highly advanced, have invented a drink called Genetix Tolonix, or G N T X, or Genetix Onix, or any one of the thousand or more variations on the sub phonetic theme. The drinks themselves are not the same. They vary between the Sullivanian, Chico, Minglings, which is an ordinary water, served at a slightly above room temperature, and the Gagalakankan of Zikatanch Anthony Keys, which kills cows all at a hundred paces. In fact, one of a common factor between all of them, beyond that fact, the names sound the same, is that they were all invented and named before the wells concerned were cont- contacted with any other wo- made contact with any other worlds. They can be made, what can be made of this fact? It exists in total isolation. As far as any theory of constructual linguistics is concerned, it's right off of the graph. And yet it persists. Old structural linguists get very angry when young Structural linguists go about on about it. Young structural linguists get deeply excited about it. Stay up late at night, convinced they're very close to something of profound importance. End up becoming old structural linguists before this time, their time, getting very angry with the young ones. Structural linguists is a bit of divided between unhappy, disciplined, and a large number of its practitioners. Spend too many nights downing their problems with the Astagon Stogodans. Now until you stood before the captain, bathtub, trembling with frustration. Do you want to interrogate any of the prisoners, sir? He squealed. Captain peered down, appeared at him with amusement. Why on good fellowship should I want to do that? He asked. Get a mission out of them, sir. To find out why they're here. Oh, no, no, said the captain. I expect they just dropped in for a quick... Chilling in the ducks, didn't, don't you, didn't, don't you? Oh, sir, they are prisoners. I must have interrogate them. Captain looked at them doubtfully. All right, he said. If you must, ask him if he wants a drink. A large cold gleam came into number two's eyes. He advanced slowly on full proof and half a dent. All right, you scum, he scrawled. You vermin, you dread full with Zappo gun. Tell you on number two, this admonished the captain gently. What do you want to drink? Number two screamed. Well, the gentleman's tonics. Sounds very nice to me, said Ford. What do you like you, Arthur? Arthur blinked. What? Oh, yes, he said. Well, I saw about fellow number two. Oh, with, with uh, please, said Arthur. Ford, lemon. Yes, please, said Ford. Would, and do you have any of those little biscuits? You know, the cheesy ones. I am asking the questions of how number two, your body quaking with apoplectic fury. Uh, number two, said the captain softly. Sir, shove off, would you? There's a good chap. 
I'm trying to have a relaxing bath. The other two's eyes narrowed and became well known in the shouting and killing people trade as cold slits. The idea of presumably the idea presumably being to give the, the, your opponent the impression that you have lost your diocese or having difficulty wake, keeping awake. Why is this fight why this is frightening is uh, as yet unsolved problem. He answered the captain, his number two's mouth, thin, hard, line. Again, tricky to know why this is understood as fighting behavior. If, while wandering through the jungle or terror, you perhaps suddenly do come upon the fabled ravenous bug bladder beast, you would have reason to be grateful if your mouth was thin, hard, line, rather than, as it usually its grasping mass of slivering fangs. May I remind you, sir, it's number two of the captain, that you have been in the bar for nearly f- over three years. A final shot delivered, number two spun on his heel, and stopped off in a corner to practice dire, darting eye movement in the mirror. He got the captain scrubbed in his bath, gave full prefect a lame smile. Well, you need to relax a lot in a job like mine, he said. Ford lo- lo- slowly lowered his hands. It would no reaction, Arthur lowered his. Trending very slowly and carefully, Arthur moved to the bath pedestal. He patted it. Nice, he lied. He wondered if it was safe to grin. Very slowly and carefully, he grinned. It was safe. Ah, said the captain. He said to the captain. Yes, yeah, said the captain. I wonder, said Paul. Could I ask you, could I ask you actually what your job is? At, your job is, at, in fact. Hand tapped him on the shoulder. He spun round. It was the first officer. Your drinks, he said. Oh, thank you, said Ford. He looked Arthur. Took Jasmine tonics. Arthur sipped his and was surprised to discover it tasted very like a whiskey and soda. Menu. And how it couldn't help noticing, said Ford. Also take a sip. The bodies in the hold. Bodies, said the captain. Surprise. Captain Pauls and thought to himself. Never take anything for granted, he thought. Could it be that the captain doesn't know he's got fifteen million dead? bodies and on his ship. Captain was nodding cheerfully at him. He also appeared to be playing with a rubber duck. Ford looked around. Number two was staring at him with a, in the mirror. But only for an instant. His eyes were constantly on the move. First officer was standing there, holding the drinks tray and smiling benignly. Body said the captain again. Ford licked his lips. Yes, he said. All those dead telephone sanitizers the count executives. You know, down in hold. Captain stared at him. Sonny threw back his head and laughed. Oh, they're not dead, he said. Good Lord, no, they're frozen. They're going to be revived. Ford did something he rarely did. He blinked. Arthur seemed to come out of a trance. You mean you got a hold of full of frozen hairdressers, he said. Oh, yes, said Captain. Millions of them, hairdressers, tired TV set producers, insurance salesmen, personal officers, Security guards, public relations, executives, management consultants, you name it, we got going to colonize another planet. Ford wobbled very slightly. Exciting, isn't it? said the captain. What? What was that lot? said Arthur. Oh, now, don't, don't just misunderstand me, said the captain. We're just one of the ships of the art fleet. We're the B. You know, Ark, you see? Sorry, I could. I just, could I just ask you to run a bit more hot water for me? Arthur obliged, and the crusade of pink fluffy water swirled around the bath, and the captain let out the pleasure and said, Sorry, pleasure. Thank you so much, my dear fellow. Do help yourselves in to more drinks, of course. The forward tossed back his drink, day drink, took the bottle from the first of the tray, and refilled his glass to the top. What, he said, is a bee arc. This, said the captain, and swish the foamy water around joyfully with the duck. Yes, said Arthur, but... Well, what happened, you see, was, said the captain, our planet, the world from which we came from, was, to speak, so to speak, doomed, doomed? Oh, yes. So what everyone thought was, let's pack the whole population into some giant spaceships and go and settle on another planet. Having told this much of his story, he settled back with a satisfied grunt. You mean a less doomed one? prompted Arthur. What did you what did you say, fellow? A less doomed planet. 
We're going to settle. You were going to settle on. Are oh, going to settle on? Yes. So he was deciding to build three ships. You see, three arcs and space. And I'm not boring you, am I? No," said Ford firmly. It's fascinating. You know, it's a delightful, reflected captain. Has someone else to talk to for a change? Nobody's eyes darted feverishly about the room again, and then settled back on the mirror like a pair of flies, briefly distracted him from their favourite piece of meat. Mouth, month old meat. Trouble with a long journey like this, continued the captain, is that you end up about just talking to yourself a lot, which gets terribly boring because it's half the time you know what you're going to, ne- to say next. Only half the time? asked Arthur, in surprise. Kept a thought for a moment. Yes, about half, I say. Anyway, where's the soap? You fin- fished around and found it. Yes, so anyway, he resumed. The idea was to get that was that into the first ship was a ship, a gold of brilliant leaders, a scientist, a great artist, you know, all the achievers. And into the third sea ship were going to people who did the actual work, made things and did things. And then a B ship, that's us, would go to everyone else, the middle man, you see. He smiled happily at them. And we were sent off first, he concluded. And hummed a little moot perfume tune. A little perfume tune which had been composed for him by one of his world's most exciting, prolific jingle writers, who was currently asleep in a hole thirty six, some thirty some nine hundred years behind them, covered what would otherwise have been an awkward moment of sights, fooled and after shuffled their feet and furiously avoided each other's eyes. Ah, said Ford after a moment. What exactly was it was it was it that was wrong with the planet then? Okay, it was doomed, as I said, said the captain. Apparently it was going to crash into the sun or something. Or maybe it was that it was the moon. It was going to crash into, into us. Something of the kind. That's a terrifying prospect, whatever it was. Oh, said the first officer suddenly. I thought it was a planet it was going to be invaded by a gigantic swarm twelve foot piranha bees. Wasn't it that that that, that was wasn't it that? Number two spun around, our eyes were blazed with cold, hard light. And he comes with the amount of practice he had prepared to put it in. That's not what I was told, he hissed. My kind officer told me the entire planet was in immediate danger of being eaten by an enormous mutant sar goat. Oh, really, said Full Prefect. Yes, a monstrous creature from the pit of hell with sowing, sighing teeth. Ten thousand miles long, breath like a boil oceans, claws that could tear continents wherever from their roots, a thousand eyes that burn like a sun, slavering slavering jaws, a million miles across, a monster such as you never, 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 ever. You may and they made sure you set off first, did they? Quite Arthur. Oh yes, the captain. Well everyone said very nicely, I thought. It was very important to morale to feel that they would be arriving up on it where they could be sure of a great haircut and where the funds were clean. Oh, yes, said Greedford. And you see, that would be very important. And the other ships, uh, they followed on after they, you, did they? But for the moment, the captain did not answer. He twisted around his bath and glazed behind, backward over the huge bulk of the ship towards the bright, classic centre. He squinted into the inconceivable distance. Oh, well, it's funny you should say that, he said, and allowed himself to slight frown at full profit. Because, curiously enough, we never heard a peep out of them since we left five years ago. But he must be behind us somewhere. He peered off in the distance again. Paul peered with him and gave him a full, full frown. Unless, of course, he said softly, they, they were eaten by the goat. Oh, yes, said the Captain, with a slight seriously creeping into his voice. The goat. His eyes flitted fast over the silly shapes of instruments and computers that lined the bridge. He winked away innocently at him. He stared at the stars, but none of them said a word. He glanced at his first and second officers, but he seemed lost in their own thoughts for a moment. He glanced at full prefect who raised his eyebrows at him. It's a funny thing, you know, said the captain. At last, but I know I've just actually come to tell the story. But that what? But now I've actually come to tell the story to someone else. I mean, does it, I mean, it does strike as you as odd, number one. Uh-huh, said number one. Well, said Ford, 
I can see that you've got a lot of things you're going to wait, want to talk about. So, thanks for drink. If and if you could, so the drop us off the nearest convenient planet. Oh well, there's little difficult, you see," said the captain. "Cause that trajectory thingy you preset before we left Gophonia came. I think partly because I'm not very good with figures. You mean you'll be stuck here on this ship?" Staying forward suddenly, losing patience with the whole trade. When are we meant to be reaching this planet you meant to be colonising? Oh, we're nearly there, I think, said the captain. Any second now, it's probably time I'm getting, I was getting out of the bath, in fact. Oh, I don't know, though. Why stop just when, when I'm enjoying it? We are, we are actually going to land in a minute, said Arthur. Well, it's not quite much, so much land, in fact. Not actually land as such, no. What are you talking about? said Ford sharply. Well, said the captain, picking up his, picking, packing his way for the words carefully. I think as far as I can remember, we've programmed a crash on it. Crash, shouted Ford and Arthur. Oh, yes, said the captain. Yes, it's a plan, plan of the, part of all part of plan, I think. It was totally good as a reason for it. I can't remember at the moment. Something to do with, uh, Ford exploded. You're a load of useless bloody loonies, he shouted. Oh, yes, that was it, being the captain. That was the reason. Chapter 25. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Well, has, has this to say about the planet of Gruff? Gana Ferinderham is a planet where each of mysterious history, rich in legend, red and occasionally green, with the blood of those who sought in time, gone to conquer her. A land of parched and barren landscapes, of sweet and sultry air, heady with a scent of perfumed springs and tickle of its hot and dusty rocks. The trickle of its hot and dusty rocks and nourished the dark and musty lichens beneath. A land of fevered brows, intoxicated imagings, particularly among those who taste the linkings. A land also called in shaded faults among those who have learned its first for uh, the lichens have found a tree to sit beneath, a land also of steel and blood and heroism, a land of the body and the spirit. This was, was its history. And all this ancient, mysterious history, the most mysterious figure of all, were without doubt the great circling poets of Arium. These circling poets used to live in remote mountain passes, where they would lie and wait for small bands of weary travellers, circle around them and throw rocks at them. When the travellers cried out, saying they didn't, why don't they go away? They get up with, go on with writing some poems instead, of pestering people with all this rock throwing business. Then they suddenly stop, and they break into one of their 794 great song circles of Vesalium. The songs were all extraordinary beauty, even more extraordinary length, and fell into exactly the same pattern. First part of the very song would tell how once one fall from the city of Asylum, upon the five sage princes with four horses. The princes were also, oh, well, of course, brave, noble, wise, travel widely in distant lands, fight giants, ogres, pursue exotic philosophies, philosophies, take team with weird guards, rescue beautiful monsters, and ravaging princesses before finally announcing that they achieved enlightenment and they were wondering of the, the for accomplished. So a much longer part of this each song will tell of the beer bickering about how much one of them is going to have to walk back. All the way to the planet's remote past is however distant Descendant of one of these eccentric poets, who invented the spurious tales of pending doom, which enabled the people to go to Whitfield to read the full, rich, and happy lives, until they were suddenly wiped out by a variant disease contracted from a dirty telephone. Chapter 26. That night the ship 
crash landed on an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet which circled a small, unregarded yellow sun and uncharted backwaters at the special end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. In the hour preceding the crash, uh, full prefect fought furiously, but in vain to unlock the controls of the ship from their preordained flight path. It had quickly become apparent to him that the ship had been programmed to convey its payload safely, if uncomfortably, to its new home, but to, but to cripple itself beyond all hope of repair in that process. The screaming, blazing descent through the atmosphere had stripped away most of the superstructure and out of shielding. It finally, in glorious belly flop, had an in, into a murky swamp, which left the crew only a few hours of darkness during which to revive or float its deep, frozen, unwanted cargo. For the ship began to, for the ship began to settle almost at once, slowly and upending Atlantic bulk with stagnant slime. Once or twice during the night, it was Darkly silhouetted, silhouetted against the sky, burning the meteors, it didn't rise to the tutorials of its descent, flashed across the sky, a grey, deeply dull light that let out a seen, roaring gurgle and sank forever to stinking depths. Then the sun came up, the morning it slid its fine watery light over a fast area, Heaving and welling hairdressers, public relations executives, opinion pollers, and, and the rest, all clawing away desperately to dry land. At least strong minded son, that strong minded son would probably go straight back down again. They continued to climb its way through the sky, and with all the, well, while the influence of its warm ray began to have, began to have some restoring effect of feebly struggling creatures. Countless numbers of them had, unsurprisingly, been lost to the swamp in the night, and millions more had been sucked down with the ship. But those who survived still numbered hundreds of thousands. The day wore as they crawled out of the surrounding countryside, each looking for a few square feet of solid ground on which collapse and recover the late shirt made the ordeal. Two figures moved further afield from a nearby hillside. Four prefect and Arthurdent watched the horror of which they had not felt, could do not feel part, apart. Filthy, dirty trick the poor, muttered Arthur. Ford scraped a dick along the mud and shrugged. An imaginative solution to a problem, I have thought he said. Then why can't people just learn to live together in peace and harmony, said Ford. Ford gave a loud, very hollow laugh. For you too, he said with malicious, malicious grin. No, it doesn't work. Never mind. Arthur looked at him as he could mad, and seeing nothing to indicate the contrary, realised it would be perfectly reasonable to assume this uh, uh, had in fact happened. What do you think will happen to, to them all? He said after a while, in an infinite universe, anything could happen, said Ford. Even survival, strange but true. Chris look came into his eyes. They passed over the landscape. They settled down on a scene of misery below them. I think they managed it, managed, I think they managed for a while, he said. Arthur looked up sharply. Why do you say that? Said he, he said. Arthur shrugged. Just as a cunt, he said. A fuse could be drawn on any further questions. Look, he said suddenly. Arthur followed his pointy finger down among the sprawling masses of figures moving or perhaps lurching. Would be more in correct, correct reflections. He appeared to be carrying something on his shoulder, and he lurched from the prostrate form into prostrate form. He seemed to weigh whatever it's just that something was, and then in a darkened, drunken fashion. Otherwise, he gave up the struggle and collapsed in a heap. I had no idea what, was, what, that, what was meant to. What was meant to me- mean to him? Movie camera said Ford, recording the stroke of movement. Moment. Oh well, I don't, I don't know about, about you, said Ford. Again, after a moment, but I'm off. He sat a little while, a while in silence. A while this seemed to require com- com- comment. Oh well, all for a while you, this seemed to require comment. Ah, oh, when did you say you're off? What do you mean exactly? Said Arthur. Good question," said Arthur Ford. "I'm getting pretty. 
I feel in total silence. Looking over his shoulder, Arthur saw he was twiddling with knobs on a small black box. Ford had already introduced his box to Arthur as sub ether sensor make, make, metric. But Arthur slowly and immediately nodded absently and pursued, not pursued the matter. He mind the universe still divided in two parts, the earth and everything else. Earth having been demolished to make way for hyperspace bypass meant that this is not a few things a little lopsided. Arthur tended to climb into the lopsidedness as being his last main contact with his home. So if for uh, sub systematics belong firmly in the everything else category. Not a sausage, said Arthur, shaking the thing. Sausage for Arthur to, to himself as he glazed listlessly at the primitive world around him. But what I would give for a good earth uh, sausage. Would you believe to fall in consideration? There are no transmissions of any kind within light areas. This lighted dip. Are you listening to me? What? said Arthur. Oh, we are in trouble, said Ford. Oh, said Arthur. It sounded like month, month old news to him. And so we picked up some, anything on this machine, said Ford. The chances of getting off this planet are zero. You may have some freak standing wave. It may be some freak standing wave effect in the planet's magnetic field, in which case we must travel around around till we find a clear reception area. Coming, he picked up his gear and stood, strode off. Arthur looked down the hill, a man with a movie camera, and struggling, struggled back up his feet just in time. To the film, one of his colleagues is collapsing. Arthur picked up a blaze of grass and strode off after the fold.